So it's those moments and how do you react? I think that's what I tell people, right? We all could say like best laid plans in life are a joke, right? But when they come up at you, how do you see them? How do you react to them? How are you prepared for it? And at the end of the day, like, how do you advocate for yourself? That's a big, big part of it. And if anyone thinks that hard work alone is all you need, you're wrong. Welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast, a podcast about women who work in sports. I'm your host, Jahan Blake. After 15 years of working for three major league teams, including the Boston Red Sox, Los Angeles Dodgers, and the Chicago Cubs, I discovered the one thing I loved the most was helping women in sports shatter glass ceilings and take their seat at the table. I loved it so much that I made a business out of it. I have the honor of coaching high performing women in the sports and entertainment industry and supporting them as they go after exactly what they want in their career. So if you are feeling tired of waiting on the sidelines, done being overlooked for promotions, and you're ready to pull ahead of the pack and take your career to the next level, girl, I'm here for it. I also created the Game of Her Own podcast to support you as well. We are here to share the stories of incredible women who work in sports and entertainment. These leaders and trailblazers will inspire you with their success and the lessons they've learned along the way to the top. Ladies, there is nothing like women empowering women. I am so honored you're here. My next guest built a sports and entertainment division at an agency where she now serves as the president. It is no surprise why Mary Scott, president of United Entertainment Group, is where she is today. Y'all are gonna love hearing about Mary's journey in the sports and entertainment industry. And it's not only because she has this high ranking title, it's because she's honest and talks about what it was like getting to where she is now. She is candid and talks about what it was like to lead a team for the first time and why she felt like she couldn't do it. I imagine a lot of you can relate to that. She talks about why she cried when she was given a career coach. And as a career coach, you know I loved hearing this story. She also talks about early in her career and how getting a job offer from the NFL changed her life. All right, friends, I can't wait for you to hear about Mary's journey. You ready? Let's do this. Mary Scott, welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast. I am so thrilled that you're here. Thank you so much for having me. The feeling is mutual. So take us back in time before we talk about your incredible career and tell us when you first fell in love with sports. Oh, that's a great question. Well, I'm going to go way back in time because my first love of sports was actually participating in sports. In high school is where I really kind of kicked into sports and played about four different sports in high school, field hockey, lacrosse, basketball, and a bit of softball. So I just fell in love with sports then. My family was a big sports family. So my brothers played, my sister played. We, you know, every Sunday would watch football. So we were big, sports was a big part of just my world growing up and not thinking at the time there would be a career in it. So that was my love of sports, I went on to play in college. I went to University of Massachusetts and played on the field hockey and lacrosse team, which was just an incredible, incredible experience. And that just furthered my love of sport and everything that I got out of it. And it was really in college where sort of the light went off, wait, hold on a second. There's actual career in sports as well. Um, And so that's sort of began my journey. All right. So then you left, you know, you're done with college. You had that realization. Okay. I can actually work. I can keep this up for like me. It was okay. I, I can people are sick of hearing me say, it, but I'm going to say it again. I'm not me a ham. I cannot keep playing soccer for the rest of my life. I can't make a career out of it. So what's the next best thing working in sports? Like didn't think about it growing up. Didn't think about it until after towards the end of college. So what was your first job in sports? So, and by the way, I totally can relate to that. I mean, there's so many more opportunities for women in sports to, you know, to some degree to play, definitely to work, but there does become this sort of cap, right? I mean, we were on the national stage for my lacrosse team and you just don't want it to end, but it, unfortunately it does, unless you're, some of my colleagues made, made the Olympic field hockey team, but for lacrosse, which is really my love, there was nowhere else to go besides recreational. So 
when I graduated college, I thought, okay, I took some sports marketing classes. I was a marketing major and I thought, well, now let me go out there and see what kind of jobs there are. And of course, this was a while ago. We won't mention any dates, but <laughs> there were not that many pathways in. They were very much more the traditional pathways, primarily, you know, going the professional sports route, the team, the league. Um, there were certainly sponsors, you know, that were involved with sports, but we just didn't have the universe that we have today. So I went about looking everywhere and anywhere. So after talking to many people, I just became like detective. I was like, okay, I know you and you know this person and I want to get to that person. And I just, I saw every person I could speak to, to try to understand really where would someone with my passion and I don't even know that I had any talents at that stage, but what were the kinds of areas that I thought I would like? So I moved to Boston and I was temping, just temping, just to get some work and still hang out with my teammates and college friends and, you know, what you do after college and just sort of explore. And again, a friend of a friend said, there's a, there's a company in New York, which is where I'm from, that was looking to start sports radio sales. I just heard the word sports. I didn't even hear anything else. And I said, I want to have that conversation. So it was called Cats Communications. I'm not even sure if it's still in existence, but they (laughs) represented radio stations around the country and they were starting to package up efficient sports buys. So someone could buy baseball, say across, you know, 20 markets or something. And so I started as an admin, which is how it was back then. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's still to some degree today, it's a good place to start. And I just went and, you know, said, I want to learn everything about this and I'll do everything and anything, even though I did question sometimes with like a college degree and coming off, you know, playing in the national championship for lacrosse, like, am I really meant to just be answering the phones and (laughs) taking notes and all of that? Well, yes, because you're in the door and you have to, you know, sort of explore it all. It was an interesting opportunity. It was a great job. I learned a lot. I met a lot of great people. But in that, I realized that advertising sales, radio advertising sales was not really what I was passionate about. And so about a year or so in, I started to set out again, now being in New York, setting out what else could there be in the sports industry? Uh, Then a girlfriend of someone, one of the sales guys worked at Madison Square Garden Mm -hmm. and set me up with an informational interview with her. And these pathways come that may or may not seem like they're right in the moment, but you always have to take them. So I had a conversation with her. She didn't have anything at the garden at the time, but she was just a dynamo. And I fell in love with her. And I was like, I want to be her. I want to be her. Like she just seemed like she had the job. And so I went back to work, wrote my thank you, kept in touch. And a few weeks later, she called, she called me and said, a PR agency is looking for an account executive. And I said, I'm in, I hung up with her. I called my, one of my dear friends from college who majored in communications. And I said, what is PR? <laughs> and that is the God's honest truth. And so she, <laughs> she helped me. This woman helped me, uh, you know, got my resume together. I was, I went in cold knowing at that time what PR was and how it was different from advertising. And the end of the story is like, I did get the job and it set me off on, you know, and just a Incredible trajectory. So that my beginning was not, it was, there's never a straight line or there's rarely a straight line. I love that you didn't know what PR was and didn't focus on what you didn't know. You said, I want it. And you went and figured it out. Like that was it. And yeah. you interviewed and got the job. And prior to that job posting coming out, you had, you didn't know what PR was. I didn't know what it was. And I did not take journalism in in college. I did not take communications in college. I focused more on marketing and sports marketing. And so I definitely had like one hand, maybe even crossed behind my back as I went into that interview and then also the job. And I think the beauty of the job was it was the agency is no longer in existence, but it was a small agency with really incredible clients. One of them, including the NFL, which was one of my next steps. So I learned a lot. I also was able to get in as an account executive and not an admin. And so 
uh -huh. it's not a really great trajectory. But I, I'm sure if I were to bring some of my peers from that, those early days and when uh, the woman who was my boss at the time came to me and said, hey, can you, can you put together a media list for this announcement we have? And I <laughs> looked at her like, yes, of course. I was like, I don't know what she's talking about. I really don't. So she was kind enough. I was able to tell her, could you just show me and then I'll do it. And, and I think she looked at me for a second to say like, how did you get this job if you don't know how to do that? But she was kind enough to show me. And I will always remember that. So were you like nervous that you didn't know what you were doing because you had like you had a skill set it might not have been in PR but you were you know a professional you had experience and so were you nervous about not knowing all the ins and outs of that particular job I was very nervous and I was I would say to some degree like a little bit insecure might be a strong word but I definitely felt I wasn't on par with the kinds of like, especially for writing, you know, communications is a lot, it's a lot of writing and that's just, that just was not my strong suit. And so I was that in, in that area, I was a bit nervous, but I just, you know, I guess I might be a, an example of like, if you put your mind to it and you learn and you work really hard and you make up for areas that are not natural to you, not that you, that it, you can do it, you know, and I sort of just found that. So yes, I was nervous. I tried to keep that in my inner voice. I just sought a lot of advice. I didn't like that, you know? And, and when you say, or, you know, you don't just say, tell me everything you know, but look, this is what I'm thinking. You know, what do you think? Or in the case of writing a press release, which I had no experience with, I would probably write it 10 times before I would show somebody and say, look, before I hand it in and say, this is my final, you know, can you give me some feedback? And so you find the people that are willing to give you that time that want to help nurture in that case, you know, the younger generation. And I was lucky to have many people in my life that had the patience to do that for me. And I think probably saw that I had something to give, even if it wasn't like you're going to go off and be a writer for, you know, the New York times. And so I would say in general, I often say, I'm not sure it's a job. It's like a love and a passion. And yes, there's a job woven around that. But I think if you can find that passion and my passion was like, wait, I'm getting paid to watch <laughs> sports and, you know, stay on top of what brands are doing in sports and athletes. And it's like, pinch me. Yes. Yeah. That's how I felt when I first started. I was just like, I, you don't have to pay me. I mean, <laughs> You, I mean, I definitely went into debt, so it was probably not the right attitude to have, but I just was having so much fun that I, I was like, yeah. ah, I'll make money later. Like, this is fine for now. I'm making like $6 an hour, which, or whatever minimum wage was in like 2001, 2002. Yeah. It's fine. Like, you exactly. Know, pay these things off later. And I did. And I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. And that, but that's true. And I think, you know, I talked to a lot of people and, and, folks in college or out of college or looking to change a career. And I said, you know, you can't think about it just for the money. You know, you, you just can't because you're not going to make the money until you're, I mean, I'm talking about communications. Of course, there's other fields where you can, but you know, it's not about that, right? It's about the experience, about what you bring to the table. And it's about being more than a fan. You know, you have to, everybody's a sports fan. Mm -hmm. You have to have a passion for the business of sports. And I think, if you do that, you know, it will all come for you. You know, you want to make money, go be a stockbroker. Yes, or that's what I was going to say. Yes. Go down the agent, the agent path, perhaps, but not, you know, not, not this field, not to start. And it can't be your driving, it can't be your driving force. Yes, because you can, you know, I had a client whose priority was making 70 grand right out of college. Yes. And then, well, you know, but also wanted to work in sports, but sports was second. And mm. so... She, you know, we, we talked about it and she was starting to realize that that was not going to happen right out of college, but she got a job making that much and more wow. straight, straight out of college. But yeah. that's, but that was her priority, right? Like that was the most important thing to her, which there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Everybody no. has their own path to follow. Mm -hmm. So tell everybody, before we talk about your time with the NFL, tell everybody what you do now and who you do it for. So I work for a company, um, United Entertainment Group. 
we are an integrated marketing agency and we focus on sports lifestyle and entertainment. So we work with brands of all different, from all different industries, from all different sizes. So, you know, everything from tech to CPG to apparel, and we help them navigate these platforms. We say whether it's people, properties, or platforms. So we're connecting them with the right people to help tell their story, the right platforms, sponsorships, et cetera. I run the integrated communi- the global integrated communications division. And so I look after sort of the more the traditional communications on both a national and a global level. But really the world of communications has tra- changed so much. So I've been in really involved with like, how do we embrace that marketing side of the business? Because really at the end of the day, we're all ultimately trying to do the same thing. We're trying to help X company communicate a message to X stakeholders. It's just how we do that is where the different you know, opportunities come. It's been wonderful, you know, to say the least and have, you know, expanded my role really on the global front. So recently opened our first op- office in Japan and I'm involved with all of our global efforts around, you know, global properties like World Cup and, and Olympics. You know, so I've been lucky enough to, as you know, do some work, consulting work uh, with UEG and uh, your title is very impressive, but you didn't say it. Will you share everybody with everybody what your title is? <laughs> Absolutely. My title is president of UEG, uh, Global Integrated Communications. So coming from PR, not knowing what it is, getting your foot in the door, being curious about everything, networking, working for the NFL, and then heading over to Edelman and then UEG. I mean, that's an impressive career that I summed up in 30 seconds, which does not even do it justice. But tell us what it was like working for the NFL, was it hard to leave such a big recognized, you know, brand name and go to Edelman? Yes. I mean, in a word, yes. So I will just say that I left the small agency. uh, I was there for about four, four and a half years. And I went to a sports marketing agency because at the time I thought I liked PR and I learned so much in that time, but I had always thought I wanted to do a little bit more of the marketing or even the event side. So I went to a company that that focused on that. And I was there for about a year and a half doing their communications, but also having exposure to different kinds of marketing disciplines, et cetera. And then the NFL called. And I say, I I tell everyone the day they called is the day my life changed. (laughs) The day I took the job anyways. So, I mean, working for the NFL was a dream. I'm such a big football fan and, you know, to be a part of a growing division, they've just expanded into NFL international. So the American bowl games, and they also were at that time launching that new thing called .com (laughs) internet, (laughs) satellite radio, and all, all of, you know, really the new media that expanded, expanded their reach. That was what I was responsible for. And it was just an amazing experience from the beginning to the end, my time there. And I felt as though I went from no offense to where I was before, because those were great places too, but I felt like I was in the majors and it was just everyone there. I just, I soaked up everything I can. Your question, was it hard to leave? It was very, very hard to leave because of all of those things I I, I stated. And, you know, I was lucky again, I mean, that uh, in, in the sense that I was not looking to leave. I was definitely starting to question what could my career track look like at the NFL. And the reason I say that is because at the time, you know, people were there for 50 years, like no one ever left. And so it was really hard to find some momentum. And I was just young and eager. And I sort of thought I could stay here and go about 10 miles an hour and probably live an amazing life because it is the best place to work. And I just realized I don't know that I have that patience in me. Still feel like I kind of still want to go 60 and above. So I was starting to think about what could that look like or where might I be able to carve a path within the NFL to to find that pathway for myself. And then Edelman called and they were starting a sports and entertainment practice. And my first reaction Yeah, not to them, to me and my inner voice was like, there's no way I'm leaving the NFL for an agency. Like, Ah! (laughs) I said to myself, 
who am I not to go explore it and see, and maybe it'll, it'll hit me in some way. And I went and I fell in love instantly with the two people who were at the time leading it. And I just realized you want to go hundred miles an hour and you want to push yourself and you want to keep going in your career. This is the right answer for you. But I pined over that decision, like intensely. And even I even talked with my boss there at the time. And I said, I'm just really, yeah. I don't know what gave me the balls to do that, but I did. And uh, I just said, I, I love it here. I have this opportunity. He talked it out with me and basically kind of, I think allowed me to make the decision that I knew was right for me. And we remain close to this day been a mentor of mine from the beginning. I often call him, I still call him to this day. So it was hard, but in my heart of hearts, I knew it was the right thing. I also knew that experience that I had there for about five years, the the connections I made, the lifelong peers and friends I made would never go away. Just because you leave a place doesn't mean that, you know, you bring all that with you. In fact, in a week, I'm going out with the NFL girls dinner. Like we still get together and it's as strong as ever. So, so I didn't look back once I made that decision and I'm really glad I did. One thing I know for sure is it can be exhausting and emotionally draining as you go after what you want in your career. Maybe you're ready for the next level, but you're not sure how to get there. Maybe you're not sure how to use your voice to grow your career or you just don't feel seen and heard in your organization. And I don't want you to have to go at it alone. It is why I'm putting together a small group of women for the Be Seen and Heard at Work group coaching experience. If you are tired of things just going, okay, this group may be for you. If you're ready to use your voice to influence change, speak truth to power, build your brand, and advocate for yourself without feeling like you're bragging, this group is for you. Enrollment opens soon. So in the meantime, I invite you to join the waiting list. Be the first to hear more about the program and also when more spots open up. You probably already know this, but it's worth saying. There is something so powerful about women empowering women. And that's exactly what you'll get in this program. Coaching and accountability from me and the support and empowerment from other women in this group. If this sounds like the right fit for you, head to the show notes and join the waiting list for the Be Seen and Heard at Work group coaching program. All right, let's get back to the episode. Talk more about what that conversation looked like when you went into your boss. Like, did you have an offer on the table or? I I had an offer and um, I know it's a bit unorthodox and I don't advise people to do this because actually what I advise people to do now if I'm helping somebody, I say, I think you need to walk in. If you want to walk into the office, you need to know what you're going in there to ask. You either need to put it forward that you'd like to stay, but you'd like to see, you know, if there could be some additional compensation or additional package, you'd like to stay, but this offer is really tempting because of X, Y, and Z. Is there anything you could do here? Or I think you need to go into that office and say, you know, thank you for everything. I've made this decision. I am going to move on. I, I didn't do that back then. I don't know, again, what possessed me or whatever. I think I was just so struggling with saying goodbye to the NFL. And at the time, of course, it's not great to get advice from other people. But when you tell people that are not in the business that they're like, are you crazy? Yeah. You're going to leave the NFL for who? For what? And Edelman's no like small company. I mean, it's highly reputable and was it was at that moment too. So that didn't help the psyche at all. I mm-hmm. think I just needed to work it out. And I think I needed him to say, you've done a great job, but it's okay. Yeah. And I, I think that's really what it was. I think my mind was made up, even though that was not what was coming out of my mouth. Like I would tell somebody, if I were talking to myself in that younger day, I would say like, come on. Yeah. Make up your mind and then, and then go in there. But he was wonderful. And you know, he still to this day says, you're my biggest success story. You left and you made it. And Uh, I don't say that for my own praise. I just say that because his support and opinion matters to me and still does to this. I'm going to push back a little bit and say that I love what you did, 
maybe you knew it was time to go. You were, you were already thinking that, right? That's why you had the interview. That's why you approached it. I mean, you, you know, experienced it and, and went and talked to them. Part of you wanted to stay if there was that trajectory for yes. yourself. Yes. And it was almost, maybe you were hoping here I am like, like some therapist or something, yeah. but maybe you were hoping yes. that your boss is going to say, actually, I have a plan <laughs> for you. I, I think that's right. And I think that was a little bit too. I mean, I don't know if that was subconscious or not, sure. but I wanted, sure. you know, I wanted there to be like, I wasn't looking for no stay. You're going to be a vice president someday. That's not how they work there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. But I was, I have to say like in retrospective, I'm really glad that I think he had my best interest in mind. And when I, I've managed a lot of people and they've come and gone and, mm. and you know, when they come into my office to tell me whether it's I'm being pursued by this one and I, but I really want to stay. Can you help me make it easier to stay or I'm leaving? You know, I always put their best interest in mind, even though, by the way, when people leave, you know, you're left like, nah, I got to find someone. I've got to do the interview. I've got to do all this. It's, it's, but we're all in this world, right? It, it, in this sports world. And I think that people have to feel the freedom to go and try other things. You know, Richard Edelman always says, I want you to fail because if you fail, you know that and you can and you can move on for that. Of course, he doesn't want big failures, but his his point is, is like, go explore, go try. I feel that in terms of jobs and people who've worked for me. And look, I've had people who've left and come back. Like you can't yeah. stop people from, you know, what they feel in their heart. And if you do, I don't think you're being a good boss or a good mentor. That's what it is. You had trust with that boss. I did. By the way, he scared me when he was my boss. At, at this, that moment was when, and when I left was actually when I saw him in a different light. He was mm. very, 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 very tough and very stoic and didn't say much. But those few words that he said were game changing to me. When I left and the things he said about me as I was leaving, and I was like, wow, could you have said some of that while I was there? <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling. Yep. You know, yeah. Like, you know that way? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what was yeah. it like going to Edelman? And as I understand it, you were building a sports and entertainment division. What was that like? It was kind of wild. I mean, it was, I guess, as I'm talking to, I'm realizing there's some patterns in my, in my career trajectory because I'll never forget. I went there and I, one of the reasons I did go there, I'm I, I was really trying to think of what that next step is and, and weighing, you know, do I stay or do I go? And one of the really incredible um, opportunities was to, to go there and to run IBM's global sports portfolio, including the Olympics at that time. And so in my mind, I said, you know, I wouldn't go to the NBA or another league. I really just had a heart for the NFL, but I thought what's bigger than the Super Bowl and all that. And there's not much, but to me, like the Olympics felt like a, a next rung, if you will, of global mm. sports. Um, yes. Yeah. That's really what got me. But when I got there, you know, I had worked at a small agency, so I knew the realm of agency. But when I got there, I had this incredible boss. She's no longer there. And she said, OK, we're going to put together a deck. I called my friend. What's a deck? I mean, oh my God, I did the same thing when I got to Deloitte. And I had been working in sports for 15 years and I still, <laughs> I still was like, I'm sorry, a what? Like, what are you talking dad, about? Like, why did what? you just call it that? I was so annoyed when I figured out what it was. I was like, why, why didn't you just call it PowerPoint? Like, <laughs> so another moment where I was like, oh boy, I got to dip my heels <laughs> in here and really like figure out. Of course I was a little older and I had experience. So it was a different, a different feeling. But I mean, I would just say it was like, it was dynamic in a different way. The NFL was dynamic because it's the NFL. I just felt like I had entered a, a different realm when you're at the NFL. It was that special. I, I really will say that. And then it was exciting because it was, you know, agency life is very different, right? You know this. It's your days are never the same. They're never the same. And I sort of relished in that. And then I just got so much great experience starting to manage more people and be more client centric and develop campaigns. 
you didn't really do that previously. Yeah. That yeah. was a whole new realm. And of course, now, you know, we're in a, a different world with that. And, and so it was sort of this really exciting time because we were building something. So we were small, we were pitching business. I had never pitched business before, not never. So there was a lot of that, you know, kind of adrenaline and excitement. And it was very much like playing sports. We won. It's like winning a game. And I was very comfortable in that kind of space, I think, from playing sports. I mean, I'm the biggest advocate. If I, I, I really do think if you've had any form of sports or competitive anything in your life, it sets you well into any environment, not just a sports mm-hmm. environment at work. Mm-hmm. I, yes. I, I lean back on that. I still do to this day. Yeah. And so you, you're really relying on your, you know, sports experience, playing in sports, being an athlete. Talk to us about what it, I mean, here you are building this new division. There's a lot of pressure with that. Like, was it stressful were you anxious about it? What was your biggest fear? There's, yeah. What was your biggest fear when you were doing that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, my biggest fear was in some ways, like, can I do it? Uh, when I first joined, there was two people that were, uh, were leading the group and they were so good. So I felt very much that I had a safety net and that we were in it together So I didn't feel as though like, I mean, yes, I had to do my part. So I was nervous, but with them, I felt great. And I learned so much from from the both of them. I'm still in in great connection with them as well. One of them left about six months later, which I told you. So that was a moment of like, okay, Mm -hmm. now now you. Mm -hmm. And then the, the lead guy left about eight years later. And I won't lie, I called my same friend who actually worked at Edelman, who was the first call, what is PR? She, she's at Edelman still. And I said, <laughs> I called her in a panic. I don't know if I could do this. I don't know if I could now all of a sudden go from running what I was running to now being, I was put in charge. Yes. And I had, a, you know, I had to have that moment. And she was like, just breathe, just breathe. You can do it. No one's expecting you to do everything. Just take it one step at a time and find your own way. And, you know, those moments felt like in some ways devastating, devastating when she left, devastating with when he left. But, in, you know, when you look back on them, those were actually key turning points in my career. Because, again, you're, you're left with like, are you going to rise to the occasion or are you going to, you know, shrink like a flower? And I remember that I got word that they were looking to replace the person who left. And I called the woman at the time who was a big wig at Edelman who didn't know me from anything because I was sort of always the number two. And I called her and I said, I want to be considered for this job. I don't want you to bring in somebody over me. I don't know where I got all this. I just said, I'm going to do it. I really didn't want to, I didn't want them to bring in somebody from the outside after I had been there for eight years and perhaps had been a little bit in the shadow of the person who was leading. And I was like, I want, would really like for you to give me a shot. And they agreed. And, you know, I did a bit of interim and then never forget, I got the call and they said, we're making you the head of the group. <laughs> wow. And what, what was your title then when you became the head of the group? So my title, so when I was, when I went there, I was vice president. And then for a long while I was, uh, the, like we had like general managers. I was like an assistant, I was like an assistant general manager. And so then they gave me the general manager title. Wow. And of course, every, all of my friends and, you know, family are like, what are you like making trades now? You're a general manager, you know, <laughs> that was a moment. And we all face those moments and those forks in the road or those moments that are put in front of you. Right. In this case, it was sort of a devastating moment because the person who I thought would be there forever and we would be like, you know, freaking frack left abruptly. So it's those moments and how do you react? I think that's what I tell people, right? We all can say like best laid plans in life are a joke, right? But when they come up at you, how do you see them? How do you react to them? How are you prepared for it? And at the end of the day, like, how do you advocate for yourself? That's a big, big part of it. And if anyone thinks that hard work alone is all you need, you're wrong. Yes, Right. You have to have that courage to pick up the phone and say, 
I want to be considered for this position. Even yeah. if you're worried, well, they're not thinking about me. They would call me. They, they my work speaks for itself. It doesn't. You no, have it doesn't. To advocate for yourself because if you don't, no one else will do it. That's exactly right. I tell everybody that, especially women. Mm-hmm. It's not mm-hmm. in our nature necessarily. <sighs> You know, Mm -hmm. and then I look at all the men around and they don't give a second thought about it. So I think that's like you have to just put away all any doubts, any I shouldn't, I couldn't, they would never until you do it. I love Robin Roberts story. She Mm. said, you know, she went from sports. She said, I called and said, I want to do I want to do news. You know, she she made that pathway for yourself look, you might get turned down, you know, you, you might not get it every time you ask, but if you're not going to do yourself a disservice by, by taking, you know, taking control and you have to be ready for all that comes with it. And I think you, you have to have proved yourself or be willing to prove yourself. And that's where I was at with it. Yeah, it, it's so true. And, and you are going to, you know, we're all going to just like fail and it's going to, you know, it's going to be miserable and you're going to hate it. But I'm telling you, it's better than the regret you feel from not going after what you want. It's something that you, I I can't articulate what that is, but there's that feeling that you have that like just kind of sits in your stomach when you know that you're not where you're supposed to be. You know that you need to make some moves, but it calls for you being courageous. It calls for you just putting yourself out there and being vulnerable. It just, and it's hard. It's very, very hard. And look, I'm not a big risk taker. I, I know it might sound like I am. I guess maybe deep down I am. I don't know, but I don't consider myself that. But I will say that somebody gave me that advice early on, advocate for yourself. And they and another great piece of advice I received was in our world, especially in the agency world or just in the world of sports, most of our jobs now consume our lives, right? Especially now yes. it's for seven. You know, a day can go by, a week can go by, a month, a year. And this person said to me, pick your head up, like do, do your work, be in the moment and all that, but pick your head up and try to envision or have a goal of where do you see yourself in two years, in five years, that plan might never come into play because something else might happen, but have that goal, always be thinking about that goal. And you know what, that shook me right out of like my well, I'm in this today and this is coming up next month. And I thought, you know what? That's a good thinking. And I think that's a way to also, you know, we talk a lot about like own your own narrative, but own your own path, own your own, you know, destiny. And again, there might be other plans that come into play, but at least you're pursuing it and not just complacent. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And I want to ask you one question before we do rapid fire questions. Oh, no, it's not mine yet, is it? <laughs> I know it, it goes way fast. So now, you know, you're general manager and then you were made president. Yes. Yeah. Like, what was that feeling like? And I, I guess what I'm trying to really ask you is the higher up you get, you have these powerful titles as what, you know, everyone is perceiving, but then you think certain things go away, like fear, anxiety, or just having all the answers, right? She's president. Mary Scott has all the answers. Like, what was that like becoming president? It was a moment. I have to be honest with you. It was a moment and it, it happened during the, the merger of the companies. And, you know, there were a lot of discussions about what is this going to look like as a merged company and what are the roles going to be and how is the hierarchy going to be? And it was, I I had a, a, a wonderful woman who really helped me think through what it is I wanted. And I also had a boss who brought on a career coach for me, like a, like a, you know, someone. And I at first cried that she thought I needed help, you know, but then I, so interesting. But then I realized when I spoke to this woman that actually I needed her to help me go from one level to another, because it's not just a title change. It is a behavioral change too. Mm -hmm. You know, you have those moments in your life where you're like, okay, maybe you start to manage people, maybe you start to get more responsibility and you have to delegate, you have to now manage, you're now responsible for someone else's career path, you're now, you know, whatever that is. And so there's those things where you almost have to say to yourself, like, I can't be in two places at once, I can't straddle both jobs, I have to now be this, I have to be that. 
And when I work with this outside uh, counselor, you know, just very simple, like, what is it that you want? And what, what do you want? And how do you articulate that? And that was ironically right before this merger happened. And so I had done that work, if you will, so that when the merger was taking place and there was all this conversation about whose title is gonna be what and who's gonna be responsible, I was so clear and focused on what I wanted my role to be I put that out there. And so that's really a big part of why it happened. And I, of course, earned it too. But, you know, that doesn't mean to our earlier point, you're going to get it. So I'm not big on titles, but I have to tell you, I felt like it was sort of a crowning moment in my career. And I felt very right and I felt justified and I, and I felt good. But that's just the beginning. So now I said, okay, now I'm in this position of power, right? I'm just going to use the air quotes on that because... And I think that's when I realized that I can stretch myself to do even more things that I didn't think was possible. I think that's where I really turned to how do I, in a more pronounced way, think about the culture of the agency and really helping the younger people? You know, how do I help with women? How do I help with diversification? How do I help with culture? Like, yes, at an agency, you're always going to be about clients and new business, but I felt like I was really able. And I was also the only woman on the, and the only woman on the executive team. I feel like it's my duty now to do that great client work, but spend a lot more time thinking about the people. And I always have been, but like I can now now I could put more things into place. Now my voice is a little bit more powerful. It's a little louder. I can, people are coming to me for that. And it, it, that's really what it meant. It was just this, wasn't just a title. I mean, it was, it's a great title to have, but it was like, what can I do with this title? And that's what I put on me, myself for the last seven years, six years. You accepted that responsibility, the unspoken responsibility that comes along with having such a, a great title and like looking back and making sure you're not the only one, right? I'm a big believer in that. I had so many people, both men and women, women who helped me along the way. And I've always been a big believer that it's our duty to pay it forward and pay it back. But, and you're right. No one said, okay, now you're going to mind, you're going to start a women's group at UBG and you're going to, it's like, nobody says that. Part of it is like making it your own. It was about like taking that next level from a work standpoint, a personal standpoint, and just like, in a way, this sounds sort of like I'm a hundred and I don't mean it to, but I also wanted to start to figure out like, what is my legacy? Like, what do I want to be known for? Whether you like it or not, you know, when you're a woman at this level, you are, you are a mentor to folks, even if you've never talked to them, they look at you, they they see what's possible, right? Sports is a man's world. It's getting better, but it's still a man's world, right? And to be able to show people what's possible, how to navigate that, that's what I put on me. And that's what made me, continues to make me gratified and, and happy, you know, every day. That's so. fantastic. Give me the chills over here, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you ready for rapid fire questions? Oh, oh no, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 12 questions. First thing that comes to mind. You got it. <laughs> what is your favorite sports moment? Oh, absolutely. Me and Muhammad Ali on a on a scissor lift at in, in 125th Street in Harlem unveiling an Adidas ad that featured him. Oh my gosh. I was going to say to you, no, no, not one that like you want to happen or you want it to happen. <laughs> that really happens. Oh my goodness. That's fantastic. I love it. All right. What is something people always get wrong about you? That I'm overly nice. Oh, we could dig into that, but it's yeah, rapid fire. Can. Okay. <laughs> it's words to say it. Like yeah. she's, she's, she's nice. We can, we can not push her over. I don't mean that, but you know. That's a good one. What is one food you wouldn't want to give up? The first thing that said to, came to my head was anything Italian. <laughs> that's a good one I'm Italian, I'm Italian and and I love Italian food so I would you know I would have to say like you know pasta and meatballs <laughs> nice are you a morning or a night person morning favorite holiday Thanksgiving 
What product would you seriously stockpile if you found out they weren't going to sell it anymore? Probably <laughs> right now, I would say <laughs> almond butter. <laughs> oh, yes. I love almond butter. Now I want to go buy some. Big health kick and I can't live without it. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram? Instagram. Who is your biggest inspiration in life? Oh, I have so many. My grandmother, my father, and one of my former bosses. As a child, what did you wish to become when you grew up? You know, as a, as a child, I was really into ballet. And I thought I would want to do something in that regard. All right, last one. Finish this sentence. The future of women working in sports is? Is incredible. Yes. It's there for the taking. We are going to take over the world. Ooh, so yes. Are. All you got to do is watch the Olympics in a couple of weeks to tell me women aren't coming on strong. And what I see in the industry and so many women who are breaking that glass ceiling and doing incredible things. Look at what you're doing. I'm so impressed by yourself. You're making your own Thank way. Thank you. It is like, I am applauding and I will continue to, to applaud. I am, I think the future is so bright. I really do. I, I think love it. Boys better watch out. Love it. I love it. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you for being a trailblazer and um, inspiration for all of us. If someone wanted to get in touch with you, how could they go about doing that? Yeah, I think the best is LinkedIn. And uh, I think LinkedIn is where I actually engage the most because it just feels it's a little bit more in a business realm. And I do like to make time for people. I just don't always have it. So LinkedIn, I, I tend to try to find some time, even if it's just responding on LinkedIn. All right. Well, thank you so much for oh spending some time with us. This was a blast. Oh, it was so much fun for me. Thank you for having me. Hopefully I gave some good stuff. So what did you think of this episode? Do you know another woman who works or is aspiring to work in sports? Would you do me a favor and share this with them? It would mean so much if together we could support and inspire other women on their journey. And let's stay connected. I love meeting and talking to new people. Follow me on Instagram at Jahan Blake and join the free game of her own community by visiting jahanblake.com. I can't wait to meet you.